You are listening to the new Mutual Audio Network. Welcome home. The following audio drama is rated PG-13, suggesting that children under the age of 13 should listen accompanied with an adult. Everyone, this is the Sonic Society 706. I am Jack Ward, and we are the world's largest showcase of modern audio drama. And I'm here with David Alt. But before we Hello. get into this week's feature, David, what, what, what? We have an old school Zugbude call. Well, um, first of all, Jack. Hello, uh, <laughs> and for our newer listeners, what exactly is Zugbude? Well, David, I, I'm glad you asked. It is, after all, in the script, and I spend a lot of time. Yes, to, yeah. yes, yes, yes. Uh, yes. Yeah, I well, know, I know. Okay. Yeah. Well, Zug, mm-hmm. Zug was our first free phone line back in the days when it was hard to send a voicemail through email. And I think you just identified that there were more of them than that, too. There were indeed more, yes. I, I was scanning through my archives. Um, Google keeps uh, meticulous records, even when you don't want it to. But uh, for this one, it was. Uh, and after Zug came Huey... Um, when Zug had to be put out to pasture. I remember. And then, yeah, yeah, and oh, bless Huey. Yes. And then, unfortunately, fairly soon after that, Huey had to get uh, get sent to the farm, and then we got Bo hacked for some reason, and then (laughs) it just all disappeared. It just all disappeared. (laughs) I think the problem was, if you don't use the phone line within, like, a month's time, it gets lost or somebody else takes Uh, it or something like that. So... We had a bit of a drought in phone calls at that time, so that's why we lost them all. And then we just went straight for, please do a voice recording and send it to us in an email at sonicsociety at gmail.com. Yes, and and so is that how this this message has come to us? Yes, it's come through old school. No, it's come through (laughs) gmail.com, sadly. Uh, But it's nice because we have a message from the first Sonicateer himself. And let's play that now. Greetings, Jack, David, and members of the society. This is your friendly neighborhood podcast listener, sometimes podcaster, sometimes whatever. Uh, It's me. And I'm just calling to wish you congratulations. 700 regular episodes. More than 700 now because, you know, um, I just had a chance to to call in. But um, in... It's just really funny because uh, I was thinking about it this morning and that when I started first listening was uh, I, I totally binged like a huge portion of the uh, original catalog. And uh, that was because um, my son, Jack, of course, um, he, you know, I was walking him around, you know, those late night, midnight, um, just, you know, trying to settle him down, had him in the baby door and just walking around doing laps around the house. And that's what I do when I I would listen to Sonic Society. And I realized that uh, it's been 15 years now. You've been doing this for 15 years. I've been listening for 15 years. And what kind of an amazing place we are at now. Um, who would have thought that, uh, well, we always kind of had a feeling that audio drama would, uh, uh, become something, but now we just look at, now they're calling it like a narrative podcast or scripted podcast or whatever, which I don't know, always be audio drama to me. Well, congratulations and, um, looking forward to whatever's ahead for us. All right. Well, have a great day and keep on casting. Bye. Aww. And yes, and thank you so yeah. much, Matt. It's it's always great to hear from you. But yeah, I, it's been even longer than that, Matt. I mean, it may be fifteen <laughs> years for you to listen. We're getting we're in our eighteenth year. This is the seventeenth season, and we started in January, so we're kind of like almost eighteen, <laughs> almost years, a, mm, which is crikey. Yeah, isn't that amazing? I know that, I keep that saying that. That is incredible. That. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I know that I've been doing this now for ten years because I'm pretty sure yes. I came on board in season seven. So yes. Yes, um, yeah. and I've been re-listening on on Monday matinee all the old Sonic Summerstock playhouses that we've been oh. putting. We've been putting them back from the very beginning, and I had forgotten 
that you were the host from the very beginning. I mean, you didn't, I was, you didn't yes. do all the introductions. You just did the announcements from the very mm-hmm. first season. And we had different guest hosts. But then mm-hmm. from the second season on, you were just the host. And that was... Mm-hmm. So that's pretty amazing, <laughs> too. But also, I just want to once again say, I really appreciate that you and Emily called your child Jack after me. I just... <laughs> <laughs> I mentioned this before. You deny it because you're just embarrassed about the situation. But I think it's 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 safe to say he's old enough now to tell him the real truth of where his name came from. <laughs> and, and I'm sure he'll appreciate it at some point. And and I think I ought to just mention here, this is Matt that you're talking to and yes. not me. Yes, because no. I... <laughs> You haven't called, you don't have a son yet, and you haven't I, called I, no. anything. No, exactly. I'm not sure if children are in the picture, but I think it would be a great, I think you'd make a wonderful I, I'm father. I'm very much hoping not. Oh, okay. Well, I think you'd make a great father, honestly. But there, that's good to know. Um, I'll, put, I'll keep that in mind as well. So, uh, but yes, Matt, and again, it's great that, Every time now, especially now, but I remember like when David came aboard, it was like we had a bit of a challenge. Like, can you go through the entire back catalog of the Sonic Society? And and it became like this this massive challenge because, like you said, we've got 700 episodes of the regular Sonic Society. Mm-hmm. At this point, we're well over a thousand episodes when you add everything else yes. into. Yep, Sonic Gold and yeah. Yeah, I mm-hmm. should find a way to actually, you know, count them all up, right? Yeah. I mean, is there a repository where someone who has such abundant time mm. can find each and every single Sonic Society episode should they need to? Well, the first, until we moved to uh, Mutual, everything was on the radio, feed, the, the, main the, feed. the feed, yeah, the main feed, which is Radio Memories, and it's still there, as far as I know, the Radio Memories Network. Ah. And I have been in one of my projects in the future, in the near future, is to try to move everything to archive.com so mm. that it will be there for generations to come. So that just mm-hmm. history, because I was listening to an interesting commentary from good old Greg Taylor, and he's kind, he's kind of come to where I've I've been for a couple of years. But to be fair, he's a little younger than I am, and mm-hmm. he's. He's at the point now that he's make he realizes he wants to make this stuff so his kids have this long legacy of his work. And I I've got literally thousands of hours at this point of wow. of me recorded for my kids <laughs> and my kids kids whenever they come and mm-hmm. and generations to come to listen to well what did that great granddad sound like and think like and act like and th- I mean it doesn't have everything obviously but it it's it's a great it's a great way to keep me in their lives when I'm. Oh come on, he's passed. still there. He's he's doing Sonic Society season 142. <laughs> that's that's hope. <laughs> that's right. it's, it's, he'll be evil brain in the jar, you know, <laughs> like that's Sonic Society 152. Somebody's just pushing the jar around in a wheelchair. You know, going from... <laughs> Let's put him in the front room for the next couple of episodes and just leave him there, right? <laughs> he'll enjoy the meadow, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> with the, with the buttes are, are going back. Yes, <laughs> yes. There's Zug and Huey and, and strange little bow hacks exactly. that just skipping through the fields. Oh. <laughs> anyway, we should go back to our feature. Thank you so again. This is great to remember. Yes, this. thank you, Matt. I appreciate thank it, you. Matt. It's great at this time of year, especially. But this week we have three shorts from Vivian C. Lamond and two features from Station Arcadia. So we actually have five features this week. Hard to believe. I know. I said I said everything at the top of the the top of the show. Yes. Yes, you did. At the top of the mutual building. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but everything begins right here on the Sonic Society. In this episode, we're bringing you a triple bill of short plays by U.S. playwright Vivian Lamont. I'll let Vivian make the announcements. Double-Edged Sword, a short play by Vivian C. Lermond, performed by Kristen Green and Shane Stefanczyk, Columbus, Ohio. Okay, sweetie. We'll steal away on Saturday. Make a whole day of it. Love you back. Oh, Junie, you're early. Seems like I was right on time. Who were you talking to? We said 6.30, and it's just... You didn't answer me. Did you text? I didn't get... I heard. I have no idea what you're... Don't you? I heard your conversation. Who were you talking to? Whoa, whoa, whoa. Hold up. Sweetie, 
Who is she? I'm not liking this. Gonna steal away on Saturday? Make a whole feckin' bang-up day of it? Who is she? Who are you? I thought I was your girlfriend. You know, like your one and only. So while we are on the subject of one and only, who the hell is Marty Man? You left your phone open yesterday. I read the text, Cuddle Bunny. <gasps> How dare you read my text? You will always be my cuddle bunny. Explain that, huh? It's not what you're thinking. Yes, well, you've got no idea what I'm thinking. Marty Man is my gramps. What? You heard me. Now I'll tell you what I'm thinking, you sneaky gobshite. You're a boffle wafflin' liar, and if you think for a minute that I'm going to hang around and put up with your... Oh. Hi, sweetie. I was... Give me that phone! I don't know who you are, but this is Junie, Pete's girlfriend... I just want you to know that you can spend Saturday and the rest of your life with the two-timing bastard, and... Oh. Oh. I'm so... so... I... I... Yes. Mum? Sorry. I hear you. I hear you loud and clear. Talk later. I'd better go. If it makes you feel better, I'm sorry about jumping the gun about your gramps. It's not going to work with us, is it? We're both too suspicious. Birds of a feather. Bye, Pete. All the best to you, Junie. Alice in Therapy by Vivian C. Lermond Performed by Kristen Green and Shane Stefanczyk, Columbus, Ohio Hello, Alice. I am Dr. Sigmund Freud. Hello. I have reviewed your patient's statement. You have a recurring peculiar dream? That's why I'm here. I want this nightmare to end. Ah, of course. How long has this dream persisted? Since I was a little girl. Please, lie down and get comfortable. Continue. Every night, I fall down a rabbit hole into a sort of wonderland. Ah, in our dreams, our suppressed imagination can break free. All human behavior is influenced by the unconscious mind. Tell me about your wonderland. It's inhabited by talking creatures who shouldn't be talking at all. First, I meet a white rabbit dressed in a funny costume, carrying a giant pocket watch. Go on. He's quite distraught. He's late for an appointment with a very mean queen. If her subjects don't play by her rules, it's off with their heads! Ugh. How is your relationship with your mother? Uh, do you find her demanding of stern temperament? She is a mother. It is natural for a girl awakening to womanhood to resist authority. If what happens after you meet this rabbit? It's all very jumbled. There's a massive caterpillar named Absalyn. Smoking from a hookah. Caterpillar. Snake. Sexual suppression. Your encounter with this creature, does it make you feel frustrated? Yes! He talks in riddles. I see. And the cat. A uh, cat? The Cheshire cat with a grin from ear to ear. I ask him for simple directions. Cheshire cat, would you tell me, please, which way I ought to go from here? He replies... That depends which way you want to go. Ridiculous creature! Do you have a natural aversion to cats? Why, no! In my nightmare, if it wasn't for chasing after my cat, I wouldn't have fallen into the rabbit hole. Then there are the pills. What type of pills? One pill makes you larger, and one pill makes you small. A curious phenomenon. Exhausting! Let us review. Would you agree that chasing your cat down a rabbit hole is rash behavior? Had you not considered that you might be on a one-way trip to this wonderland? I can't control a nightmare, can I? Ah, but you can discover the correlation between the waking state and the dream. 
Now you're talking Jabberwocky. Jabberwocky? Gibberish. Now see here, young lady, I... You see here. I didn't come to have you meddling about with the state of my waking mind. I came here to have you slay my dream demons. Petulant, Harvey. Perhaps you should examine your reality with closer scrutiny. Perhaps you should take responsibility for your curiosity and acknowledge that behavior has ramifications. I did not choose to have this dream. Still hostile towards the rules, I see. Still resistant to authority. Sit down, Alice. Take deep breaths. There now. Feel better? Let us continue. How does this dream end? I wake up, sitting under a tree. A wiser young woman from the experience. I am? This dream, it is a mere metaphor for a rite of passage, for exploring the unknown. It is? In future psychoanalysis, our sessions shall travel deeper into your psychosis and sort out the roots of your dream anxiety disorder. Psychosis? Dream anxiety disorder? I am quite confident we shall put your dream demons to their final rest. I will see you next Wednesday, same time. Meanwhile, I have written a prescription. Take thirty minutes before your bedtime. Thank you. I really do want to get better. Alice, in Wonderland. <laughs> this shall be a case study for the ages. Black Current Jam, a monologue by Vivian Lermond. Blocking memories in my mind of better times, I put the kettle on and wait for the boil, slather my toast with too much butter, topped off with the last of the jam, my knife swirling abstract designs through full-bodied berries. The kettle signals. I steep my tea, Earl Grey, every day, as the kitchen clock ticks time away. Outside, pre-dawn gives way to another day just like the last. Sunrise, sunset, and yet... Perhaps today is the right day for a life rearranged, a life that pushes past cloud cover and molted shades of gray and gives way to a sunburst of possibility. My tea has gone cold. I munch the last bit of toast, dripping savory splatters of jam juice on my pajamas. It will leave a stain, I know. A ghostly, pale, violet-hued, imprinted memory of this breakfast on the last day of my old life. I push open the window and breathe in the subtle passage of winter commingled with the early scent of spring, wakeful to the promise of unpredictable skylines, rose-gold sunrises and multi-hued sunsets, tinted with the color a faded black currant jam. Thank you, Vivian Lamond, and your actors for those three short plays. Hey, Bronwyn here, one of the voice actors for Station Arcadia. Welcome to our pilot episode. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider sharing our show with a friend or talking about it on social media using the hashtag ARCPOD, spelled A R C P O D. As a young podcast, word of mouth is vital, and we'd really appreciate your help in getting our show off the ground. Thanks, and enjoy episode one, By the Wayside. Welcome, anyone? <sighs> is anyone actually listening to this? I mean, is there anyone really out there? <laughs> well, if you are, thanks for tuning in. You're listening to Station Arcadia. My original plan was to have some music to play, 
I mean, that's what you do with radio, right? You you play music and stuff. Yeah, that makes sense, right? I mean, that that makes sense to me, at least. Unfortunately, we have no music to play. My soul still can't get any music off my old Syntec X, so that's off the table. And Joe wouldn't let me sing, since, apparently, singing doesn't count as music, which it does. I, it totally does. Thanks, Joe. Ah, sorry, I'm... I'm getting off track. Um, where was I? <sighs> right. Anyway, I apologize for the lack of music. I do have something else planned for tonight's broadcast, though. A story. Because, you see, the station can show me things, and I figured I could share them with you. All I have to do is connect to Arcadia. There is a saying in Talsoria, whispered in dark alleyways, blared on neon signs. Keep up with the times, or be left behind. Talsoria is overrun with technology, bathed in bright lights and evolving tech woven into every nook and cranny. Corporations preside over everything, even the government. People live in the intoxicating mix of aesthetics, bright lights, fashion, enhancement, trends, tech. They want it all. And they want more. They always want more. On the surface, it's all high tech, high life. You see, most people thrive there, in their bubbles. And if you go along with that, like they want you to, like you're expected to, you wouldn't know any different. Below the surface, however, is a dark truth. Those who dare to step outside the illusion everyone else lives in will find themselves swept under and left behind in the bygone era of yesterday. They fail to upgrade. They fall between the cracks of this place and are left to rot with the rest of the things the consumers throw away as they move on to the next new product. And yet, even in the dark corners of the streets, there are people who won't accept that. Those at the lowest of the low will find ways to keep living. And take Lux, for example, a young lady who lives in the Nexus, one of Telsoria's cities. She scrapes by each day, scavenging and reselling old tech, selling her finds to smugglers. When every day brings some new piece of technology, the current one will inevitably be tossed in the trash. And that's where Lux comes in, taking these washed-out devices and products for her own purposes. For her, the value in use outweighs the aesthetics. Now this kind of thing is classified as illegal in Talsoria, but Lux doesn't care about that. Above all else, she cares only about survival and getting from one day to the next. Um, hang on a moment. Uh, Arcadia, what is it you want me to- Children are the seeds of the future. Plant them in the place where they will grow. Plant them into the arms of the pomegranate society. Afternoon, Nikki. You can't been here now? Not for long. You know I like to move around. <laughs> Don't I ever. I suppose I'll be seeing you on the east side come two days? Only if you work in the east side, Mel. I'll see what I can do. had something up her sleeve. I mean, think about it. Stitch told us that he saw Astoria a couple months after she disappeared that someone had seen her. And after that, sure, people might have hopped on the conspiracy train, but when he showed us that picture, it looked exactly like the prince. Hey, what are you yapping about over there? Oh, uh, 
Hold on, I gotta go. Get over here. You shouldn't be talking about that stuff out in the open. Do you know how dangerous that is? Yeah. Yeah, of course I do. And you'd better have a good reason for shouting about dead revolutionaries. I wasn't shouting. But I'm looking for someone. Looking for trouble, more like. That too, but later. I'm trying to find... Hey, what do you know about the revolution? I hear it's still up and running, even though it kind of took a hit after the Prince and Cassandra. Everyone knows things about the revolution. It's dead. So you'd best be keeping your nose out of where it doesn't belong. That sounds like something a revolutionary would say. I'm no revolutionary. I'm a homeless old woman, and you're either a brave kid or an incredibly stupid one. Haven't heard that before. Well, get it in your mind. Keep your mouth shut and your eyes forward is my advice. Fine. Don't need your advice anyway. You're clearly not who I'm looking for. Remember what I said. Keep out of it. It's not a place for a kid. Wait. The revolution? And... Nikki, why? Um, sorry. Uh, sometimes Arcadia will show me things out of the blue when she wants me to see something. I'm not sure what they were talking about, but, uh, um, it just happens. Now where was I? Today, Lux is at it again, conducting another harvest of parts, rooting through tossed-away items deemed as worthless and out of touch. She travels the dark and dirty back streets she knows all too well, the places the neon lights won't bother to touch in order to reach her destination. She travels to the Waste Bin, one of the city's trash heaps where old discarded technology is thrown away. But these places are gold mines, despite scavenging being illegal on all fronts. The Waste Bin has what she needs, and she's not afraid to get her hands dirty. She's used to stealing, used to working alone. Not like there's a choice when the city leaves you behind. Arriving at the Waste Bin, Lux sets about scouting the area. She has a routine for these jobs. First, scout the area for possible complications. Second, take down any security cameras around the perimeter. Third, make sure there are available escape routes. And fourth, cut the chain link fence. She cuts through with ease and descends into the heaps of thrown away items. She grabs as much as she can, however much can be shoved into her backpack and still carry. Phones, electronic watches, AI, and cybernetic parts. Headphones, a synth tech. Anything that exists as part of Talsoria's empire of technology and high life. Lux makes to leave, but as she does, she accidentally sets off the perimeter alarm. She swears under her breath. She could have sworn she checked. They must have beefed up security after her last run. Lux hurries her pace along, hearing the sound of alarms and shouts of people behind her. She throws down a handmade smoke bomb to confuse her pursuers and have cover. As much as she would love to argue about how stupid it is that repurposing technology is labeled as a crime, she can't afford to let them catch her. In the end, Lux manages to get away with her finds, lifting a manhole cover and slipping into the tunnels to make her getaway. Sewer tunnels can be quite messy, but they're useful if you need a quick escape. Using a map, she follows an old trail until finally feeling like she's put a good distance between herself and the waste bin. Lux goes above ground once more, still sticking to the back alleys, ignoring whatever passerby crosses her way. Oh, um, uh, one moment. I think Arcadia wants to show me something again. I don't know. She seemed fine, just mad at me for talking about the prince out loud. I think she's involved, though. Yeah, I mean, she didn't report me to anyone, and she seemed more like a tough love type than a condescending type. I don't know. We can talk about it later, I just got home. You too. See ya. Got sidetracked on their way back home. I'm sure. Soma, Eris, I'm home. Memory, what took you so long? <sighs> Sorry, I got stopped by some old lady. Nothing too eventful. Oh, was she nice? 
Hardly. She heard me talking about the revolution and told me to keep my nose out of it. Do you think she's a part of it? Mmm, maybe. But she wasn't very helpful. Well, it's a start, right? Yeah, bud. It's a start. Hey, Eris? Can you put my calm in my room for me? I'm gonna make dinner. Thanks. Soma, what do you want to eat? Alright, now that that's done with... Lux returns to her home, a dull and dreary-looking apartment on the fifth floor of a building, and begins to look over what she managed to pull, evaluating and cleaning as she goes. She then starts to build a few items with what she gathered in order to fill a couple requests from clients. This is as much of an important part of her work as the actual scavenging. Anything she didn't deem worthy to sell, or didn't use for crafting, she could always use for herself at least. An alert on a worn pager pulls Lux from her cleaning, and she looks at the message. After gathering up some things she had set aside, she packs them to take them to the waypoint. Unfortunately for Lux, her usual client she set out to meet won't be there today, but Prometheus said Zay would be sending someone in their stead. Lux wishes this wasn't the case, but whatever, as long as whoever Zay sent would still pay. She doesn't mind working with smugglers, since the profit is good. But snags like this could be... annoying. She arrives at the drop point by motorbike, a truck stop near the edge of the city, and begins to look for her contact. Easier said than done since it's not Prometheus, but Zay sent her a photo of who would be meeting instead. Basic looking guy. They'll be taking this stuff off to Hardison. As long as this person doesn't try anything, it should be a relatively easy transaction. However, sounds of some commotion catches Lux's attention as she wanders near a few transport trucks. Keeping close to the vehicle, she peeks down between the trucks and sees the source. From what she can tell, it looks like a few of the so-called authorities have arrested someone and oh, not just anyone. Lux recognizes the person as the same one in the photo. Either this person was a novice smuggler or an idiot, but that doesn't matter because her contact has been arrested. The transaction has been compromised. She has to leave now. Lux backs away as quickly and as carefully as she can before she can be noticed, or worse, before her contact sees her and tries to sell her out. She falls back into the shadows and retreats to her waiting motorbike. Someone calls out as she starts up the engine. But by the time anyone could really notice, Lux is off and into the night. She needs to lay low for now and see about getting a new smuggler to deal with. Well, that's it. That's the story. That wasn't too bad. Sometimes you gotta make do with what you got. Like Lux does, I guess. And yeah, maybe she's still out there, somewhere, doing just that. Scavenging and gathering the forgotten. Discarded. It's too bad we still can't get that Synthetic X to work. Or at least pull music from it. Yeah, maybe next time, if Lysol can get it to work. Well, um, until then, stay safe. Uh, stay moving. And stick close. You've been listening to Station Arcadia. Station Arcadia is a podcast by Metal Steve Productions and licensed under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Sharealike 4.0 International License. It is produced by Eliana SD and CVVM and directed by Tova Brantner. It is edited by Eliana SD and J.R. Steele with soundscaping by Becker Juan and music by Theo Goodwin. Today's episode was written by Shay Topaz with scenes by Tova Brantner and J.R. Steele and featured Jade Virginia as Cass, Alison Cardenas as Memory, Lauren J.L. Hall as Nikki. F.A. Calkins as Soma, J.R. Steele as Eris, Haley Willis as The Mailman, and Becker Juan as a Talsorian Advertiser. 
Join us on Twitter and Tumblr at Station Arcadia for more content. Check out our website, stationarcadia.com, for a transcript of this episode as well as information on the cast and crew. Today's fun history fact of the week, Sultan Mehmet, the conqueror of the Ottoman Empire, once formed a battle strategy that involved getting around a naval barrier by pulling all of his ships over land. And it worked. Hey, Bronwyn here, the voice of Alice Harlow. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider sharing your show with a friend or talking about it on social media using the hashtag ARCPOD, spelled A-R-C-P-O-D. As a young podcast, word of mouth is vital, and we'd really appreciate your help in getting our show off the ground. Thanks, and enjoy episode two, What the War Left Behind. Welcome, anyone. Anyone at all? You're listening to Station Arcadia. Arcadia has another story for me, and I'm going to share it to someone. Hopefully someone is listening. Even if nobody can listen, we're going to be official and organized, as Joe says. Joe made me a broadcasting schedule, the works. It really does make it feel so much more official. You know, she loves doing paperwork for... Some reason, so many lists and schedules. <clears throat> In other news, Lysol still hasn't gotten anything off the Syntec X, but they say they're working on it. Yeah, I'm, I'm not really sure what I'm supposed to do or say at the beginning of these things, so, um, yeah, I'm just gonna start. Let's start. There is a man riding through the wasteland. His horse moves tirelessly through toxic mud. A horse made of metal and powered by diesel. A live animal would never make it out in the wastes, so mechanical mounts like this one are not an uncommon sight in the Empire. The man sitting on top of this particular mech is huddled against the wind, holding tightly onto the reins. His name is Noah, and he's looking for someone. Noah is exhausted, worn out from the strain of a hopeless search, grief, and loneliness. His gas mask hides his face, but you can still see the determination that fills him. He's looking for his fiance, who was declared missing in action after fighting for Surrogan in one of the pointless constant battles against the other empire countries. The wastes are eerily quiet compared to the never-ending air raid sirens of Noah's hometown, Paramon. The only sounds existing are the creaking of his horse, the mud beneath the metal hooves, the hisses of breathing through his gas mask, and wind whistling across the wastes. Sometimes, In the distance, he hears gunfire or the explosions of bombs being dropped. But that's just a part of life within the Empire. Noah knows his mission is hopeless, and the likelihood of finding one man in the wastes is almost impossible. But it's amazing what love can make you do. The wastelands are full of danger, more so than everyday life in the Empire. And it's not just the war to worry over, it's everything the war left behind. Landmines and barbed wire, hazardous chemicals and pools of toxic sludge. And then there are the scavengers. Noah hasn't encountered any of them yet, but he's caught glimpses of them in the distance. Scavengers are the people who live out in the wastes collecting the valuable leftovers. Noah's weapons, supplies, and mechanical horse would be quite the find for them. 
he has to be careful. Mel and his fiance met in the army. All countries in the Empire have mandatory service, and Surgan is requested to serve for at least five years. Noah was in his third, and Milo in his second. That was when the two of them met and became acquainted. Two and a half years later, Milo asked Noah to marry him before he went off to the next battle. Two months after that, Noah got a letter telling him that his fiancée was missing in action. More often than not in the Empire, that means blown to bits, uniform, dog tags, and all. But the missing in action label means there's still a thin sliver of hope, and Noah will cling to that until he can find out one way or another. Noah is looking for closure. That's what he's trying to convince himself. That he wants to know if Milo is dead or alive. But that doesn't stop his thoughts. Running wild with hope that Milo is still out there. Noah's rational mind knows how insanely small the chance is. But the hope remains. He's so focused on his thoughts and the journey ahead of him that he doesn't even notice the two scavengers behind him, following through the wastes. The attack is sudden and without mercy. It catches Noah off guard. The first gunshot just misses his shoulder. He ducks to the side as a second shot slams into the ear of his horse. He breaks into a gallop, leaning low over his horse's neck as more shots fly past him. They keep running even more once they start to lose them, flying through the wastes at a breakneck speed and hoping desperately that there are no landmines ahead. He pushes the mech far beyond the limits of what any ordinary horse could take, and by the time he sees the coil of metal on the ground, it is far too late to turn or slow down. A mechanical horse can keep going through a lot, but it can still stumble on barbed wire. Noah is thrown forward out of the saddle and goes flying as the horse topples into a muddy pit. He crashes into an old, half-rotted barricade and is knocked out instantly as the rest of the barricade collapses on top of him. Noah stirs to find himself pinned under rotten wood and more barbed wire, with his horse and supplies gone. He lies there for a long time, looking up at the grey sky through the planks of wood, and thinking about Milo. He has all of his letters tucked into the front pocket of his shirt, including the one about Milo being missing. He can't reach them, pinned and injured as he is, but he's read them so many times he could practically recite them anyway. Under the gas mask, he realizes he's crying. It starts to rain. Rain that hisses against the wood he's pinned under. I was grateful that he still has his gear on him. Acid rain is just another part of life in the Empire. Eventually, Noah falls asleep, still unable to move. Oh, um, I, I think Arcadia has a transmission for me to show. Um, here, let me just... Is this the office of Detective Theodore Montgomery? I have an appointment about this time. Yes. I assume you're Miss Harlow? That would be me, yes. Have a seat, then. What's the reason for your call? Cheating spouse? Background check? I do want to say, I make it a point not to investigate MIAs. So if this is about the war... No, no, it's about my daughter. She's missing. Ma'am, I just told my you... My Alice is 19. She still has a few years before she has to go out and fight. But I... I, I can't find her now. Hmm. How long has she been gone? Almost a week now. 
She said that she would be stepping out of the house, but she's yet to return or even call us. I'm worried something terrible has happened to her. Does Miss Alice have a habit of doing such things? A bit. She's always been a precocious one, and she doesn't like me or Henry breathing down her neck all that much. But I don't think she understands how dangerous things are. We'll already be losing her for five years. I don't want to lose any more time with her than I have to. Mrs. Harlow, I think I know what happened here. You do? I think that your daughter just got fed up with you and your husband being overbearing and decided to strike out on her own. And, unfortunately for you, I don't make much of a habit of getting involved in finding kids who want to disappear from their parents. She allowed to be back in a few days, or she's halfway across the country in a convoy or a bird. But... There's a bag of jerky next to the door. Feel free to take it as consolation for your daughter. This is your job. You can't just refuse to do this. Funny enough, I work in the private sector. So yes, I can just refuse to do this. Since you haven't hired me, I'm under no obligation to do anything you ask. You aren't interviewing me right now, Miss Harlow. I'm interviewing you. Please, Mr. Montgomery. If anything, can you just find where she is so I know whether she's okay? I've already lost my son, and I can't bear to live not knowing if she's alive or not. You don't even have to tell me where she is. If you don't want to, that is. <sighs> Fine, then. Is there any other information about Alice you can offer me that might help? No, I'm sorry. I have some pictures of her, though, if that helps. I... yes, that'll work. Thank you for coming in, Mrs. Harlow. I'll keep in contact. Thank you, Detective Montgomery. Don't... Teddy is fine, all right? There's no need to be all stuffy about this. All right. You can still take that jerky if you want. I... I think I'm fine, thank you. Damn it. Did... Did that man just try to offer jerky as a consolation prize for someone's daughter? You know what? Never mind. No, um, back to Noah. Noah wakes up to the sound of wood being shifted. It takes him a second to remember where he is, his vision blocked by the mask. He can't see what's happening, but he can guess. More scavengers. He struggles to reach his gun to defend himself. A few more planks move aside, and he sees a blurry image of a person with goggles and a scarf wrapped around their face. She doesn't wear a gas mask, and the hand that holds out to him is missing two fingers. He takes it, and she pulls him to his feet. Silently, she helps him back to her home. It's a former bomb shelter, fortified with scraps of barbed wire and metal. As soon as they're inside, Noah sinks into the chair next to the makeshift door and takes off his gas mask. The air inside the small room isn't very good, but it's a little cleaner than the air outside. He cleans off the lenses while his rescuer brings him a cup of water. He learns her name is Alesta, and her lungs are too damaged from gas attacks for her to speak or travel for long periods of time. Her partner used to do most of the scavenging, but they died not too long ago. She'd heard Noah being attacked and had gone to pick up the scraps. Noah tells her about Milo and his desperate search. She listens to him speak before she stands up and puts on goggles and a scarf, gesturing for Noah to follow. He puts on his mask and follows her back outside. Not too far from the shelter, there's a chain-link fence still standing despite everything. Hanging from it are dozens of sets of dog tags. Alesta points at the right end of the fence, where less hang and tells Noah that Milo's might be there. He runs up to the fence and starts to search, Alesta quietly helping him as he does so. And then, all the way at the bottom, kneeling on the ground as he searches, Noah finds Milo's dog tags, his engagement ring still on the chain. Noah spends a long time kneeling on the ground, holding the chains in his hands. 
he's found his closure. Well, I guess it's good for him, you know, that he found closure. Though honestly, I think I'd rather not know. Then you still have that hope, right? Yeah, I'd rather have hope. Maybe I'm being silly, I don't know. Sorry, this is a downer of an ending. You know, things aren't all bad. I mean, there's, um, well, Zed's from the Empire, and she's pretty cheery, so I'm sure there are good things there, too, you know? And there are probably good things in other places. <sighs> oh, Arcadia wants me to listen to something. Maybe it'll be happy. If this is a dead end, I'm going to lose my mind. You chase a girl's paper trail halfway across the city, and she doesn't even have the decency to clean a non-abandoned location with a clean floor and... Hey, you didn't say there'd be two of you. Oh, thank God. Let's make this quick. I don't trust you guys not to leave a trail. Bold words coming from the likes of you. I'd thank you to not make comments about things you don't know about. All right, that's enough between the both of you. We're here to pick up the hardware, and then we can both be on our way. I just think it's suspicious they brought so much backup when they knew it would just be the two of us. Back alley deals like this are never really a sure thing. He has a point. And another thing. Why are they so cheap? Seems like you're losing a lot of profit on this. That burners. About 17 bodies in the whole lot. Hold on a second. That wasn't part of the deal. You can take it or leave it, little miss. Call me that again. I dare you. Uh, what I believe my associate here is trying to say is that we can't afford to take on burners. We already get blamed enough for things we didn't do. We can't afford to implicate ourselves any further. I wouldn't worry too much about it. What do you mean? You won't be able to do much to implicate yourselves anymore once we are done here. Blue Bell, they're undercover government. Uh -huh. Okay. Okay, I just have to get out of here. Back the way I came. They doesn't seem too useful. No weapon. Can't run. <laughs> well, no skin off my back. No, I'm not with them. I was... You can save your excuses. I'll make it quick for you. Um... Looks like you could use some help. Alice, I found someone. How do you know? Is that another government lackey? Well, they don't make much of a habit about shooting their own men for no reason. He's... Uh, uh, hold on. Checking out the view there, doll? No, 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 of course not. I was just... I can tell you where I got the start if you'd like. It doesn't seem much your style, but who am I to judge? Um... Are you flirting with him? I'm just making conversation, Alice, for God's sake. He's... he's kind of dirty, isn't he? Oh, now you're just being rude. The man was nearly shot. What's your name? Teddy. Last name? I don't want to tell you. Well, what's Mr... I don't want to tell you? Doing at a clandestine weapons deal. It was your mother. Mrs. Harlow? She I knew wanted... it. I knew she wouldn't be able to keep her nose out of my business for one week. She's such a pain, I told you she'd do this. I know, Alice. I mean, I'm a grown woman. I'm old enough to drink in Westerfield. Everyone is old enough to drink in Westerfield. And yet, here she is, sending some weird, 
dirty man to find me in the middle of an important meeting. I think your comments toward me are starting to become a little grating. Get up then. I can't walk. My cane... Here. Thank you. Let's get out of here before more soldiers show up and with bigger guns. Why would I go with you? Oh, I see the confusion. You don't have a choice. Sorry about the poor initiation, but you're now an official, unofficial member of the Clare Court Revolution. Interesting. Listeners, stay safe, stay moving, and stick close. You've been listening to Station Arcadia. Station Arcadia is a podcast by Metal Steve Productions and licensed under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Sharealike 4.0 International License. It is produced by Eliana Esty and CVVM and directed by Toba Brantner. It is edited by Eliana Esty and J.R. Steele with soundscaping by Becker Huang and music by Theo Goodwin. Today's episode was written by Quinn O.A. Feinberg with scenes by Toba Brantner and J.R. Steele. It featured Jade Virginia as Cass, Andrew Simons as Teddy, Cole B. as Bluebell, Bronwyn as Alice Harlow, Rowan Wright as Mrs. Harlow, and Janiah Riley as the gun dealer. Join us on Twitter and Tumblr, at Station Arcadia, for more content. Check out our website, stationarcadia.com, for a transcript of this episode, as well as information on the cast and crew. Today's office supply of the week is the staple remover. Do you own a staple remover? Should you? And that's this week's show. Please check out the show notes on the Sonic Society website at sonicsociety.org. Check out our Twitter feeds at Sonic Society or at David Alt. Or join us in discussion at the Audio Drama, Radio Drama, Mutual Audio Network, Fans or Sonic Society Facebook groups. Oh, sorry. I, I'm just... <laughs> I get enthralled with your voice once in a while. Next week, we will enjoy some Rusty Quill Mad Capri. Until then, I'm Jack Ward. And I'm David Alt. Have a lovely day, everyone. Bye for now. Sonic Society is written and produced weekly by Jack J. Ward and David Alt, with original music by Sharon B. at SharonB.com. All features, interviews, and audio drama shorts are owned completely by their originators and provided to the Sonic Society by Creative Commons Licensing. The Society itself originates from Halifax, Nova Scotia, Canada. Thanks for listening. This has been an Electric Vicuna production. Hiya, kids. This is Stinky the Elf coming to you from the North Pole. You know, Santa Claus's workshop, right? Well, I've been asked to convey a special message to you that my boss, Santa Claus, that's right, the jolly old fat guy in the red suit, wants to hear from all the little boys and girls out there. Here's an opportunity to tell him your Christmas list and any other special holiday message you got. And on Fridays, starting the day after Thanksgiving, my boss will read your message out loud on a new podcast called Santa's Inbox, exclusively on the Mutual Network. He'll mention your first name only, plus the town you're from, and then read your email out loud so everybody can hear it. Ain't that exciting? Yeah, Sandy told me that he used to read letters from kids on the radio back in the day, but I told him, I'm only 300 years old. I can't remember that far back. <laughs> okay, what else? Oh, yeah, this offer is open to anybody. Kids, grown-ups, the young at heart, anybody who wants to send a special message or a dedication to anybody else. So anyways, start sending Santa Claus your emails now to santas.xmas.inbox at gmail.com. That's S-A-N-T-A-S dot X-M-A-S dot I-N-B-O-X at gmail.com. 
Kids, please ask your folks to send your email for you.